ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد As we spoke last week about Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Basri رحمه الله تعالى Is the, is the volume good? Is the volume good or still needs to be put? Mustafa, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So we spoke last week about uh, Imam Al-Hasan Al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala and uh, we spoke about where he was his birthplace then where he grew up he was born in Medina grew up in Medina and he was taught and educated by the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he learned from about 120 companions uh, then he became a very well-versed scholar to the extent that the companions would refer people to him for fatwa. It's like Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he would tell people, you know, ask and learn from Al Imam Al Hasan from Al Hasan Al Basri, because he learned and he did not forget. And we said he mastered uh, hadith and he mastered fiqh and students and people came to him to learn. He moved to Al Basra and this is where he became more known and uh, he gained more prominence and uh, we spoke about his physical the physical aspect of his body we said he was physically strong very well very well uh, built and we mentioned uh, that even his wrist was about a hand span his wrist was a hand span so that shows you he was a very strong person and another hidden aspect of his character we mentioned was that he was a very strong warrior fighter so and he was very good with the sword he was very good with the sword anyone who's uh, carried a sword most of the swords you have today are actually for uh, a more of a show kind of thing they're just for you to hang them somewhere and show them uh, so a sword when you hold it it's quite heavy so for you to be able to maneuver and fight with a sword you need a very strong arm very strong arm so Al Hassan Al Basri was among the best people in terms of dealing or dealing with like the best samurai of the, of the time at the time one of the best samurai um, and he was a military commander as well these this aspect of Al Hassan Al Basri is not known what we know about him mainly is his words of wisdom and yes this really stands out with Al Hassan Al Basri as we said Muhammad uh, Ibn Ali Ibn Al Hussein the grandson of Al Hussein, radiallahu an- anhuma, uh, he said, كان كلامه أشبه بكلام الأنبياء. His words of Al Hasan Al Basri are similar to the words of prophets. So when he spoke, he spoke gems. That was Al Hasan Al Basri, and uh, so he lived a life. He was good with his clothes, so he he usually d- dressed up nicely. But he still didn't live a life of affluence. He didn't chase or pursue this dunya. Today we will show the wisdom or the wisdom side of Al Hasan Al Basri, the wisdom side of his character. So we're going to take a lot of his statements. So I will be reading the Arabic to see, even in Arabic, they're so poetic. His words are very poetic, and their meanings are profound. So I will be reading some of his words, some of his statements, the famous ones, and. I'll just translate them. When we need to explain and expound on some of them, inshallah, we will do this. So one of his most famous statements, he says, يَا بْنَ آدَمْ نَهَارُكَ ضَيْفُكَ فَأَحْسِنْ إِلَيْهِ فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ أَحْسَنْتَ إِلَيْهِ اِرْتَحَلَ بِحَمْدِكَ وَإِنْ أَسَأْتَ إِلَيْهِ اِرْتَحَلَ بِذَمِّكَ وَكَذَلِكَ لَيْلُكَ He says, O oh son of Adam, your day is a guest. Each day is a guest. You are the host. So treat it well, means use it well, invest it well. Then it will leave, when it leaves at night time, it will leave with so many praiseworthy things about you. So it will be for you rather than against you. But if you mistreat it and misuse it, then it will leave with blame on you. So it will be against you. And it says the same applies to your night. He also says, Ibn Adam. طَئِ الْأَرْضَ بِقَدَمِكَ فَإِنَّهَا عَمَّا قَلِيلٍ قَبْرُكَ إِنَّكَ لَمْ تَزَلْ فِي هَدْمِ عُمْرِكَ مُنْذُ سَقَدْتَ مِنْ بَطْنِ أُمِّكَ Very poetic words. 
and they are profound. He says, Ibn Adam, son of Adam, you know, w walk on earth with your feet, right? You walk on earth with your feet. Soon, this earth that you walk on, it will be your home. It will be your grave. So you'll be underneath. So what he says, now you are on top, tomorrow you'll be underground. Then he says, from the moment you fell from your mother's womb, so you were from the moment you were born, you have been destroying a construction, one brick at a time. And this construction is your age, is your time, your lifespan. So basically each day, he says, you're taken away from your lifetime, each day. So he's giving you a different perspective on time, on days. وقال ابن آدم أصبحت بين مطيتان بين مطيتين لا يعرجان بك خطر الليل والنهار حتى تقدم الآخرة فإما إلى الجنة وإما إلى النار فمن أعظم خطرا منك He says son of Adam You are riding all the time on two type of riding animals Two type of let's say vehicles There's no stand still These vehicles or these two riding animals are carrying you against your will, against your wish until you reach the Akhirah, the last day you either end up in paradise or you end up in the hellfire he says who could be in a state that's more dangerous than this so he's basically saying pay attention, take life seriously each day, each night, that means you're losing more of your time on this earth so use it wisely, so it's either for you or against you and we come here to one of the most uh, of uh, most of his, most of the, one of the most famous statements of Al Hasan Al Basri, where he says, "Ibn Adam, inna ma anta ayyam, kullama dhahba yawmun dhahba baghduk." Very precise statement, but very profound. He says, "Son of Adam." Here he defines who you are as a human being. So sometimes we define or we identify ourselves with our possessions, with our assets, with our bank accounts, with our grades and our uh, certificates and uh, our degrees or with our ethnicity or with our clothes or with our status with anything else or our even our bodies our physique yet al hasan al basri he gives a different definition of human beings he says o son of adam you are merely a bunch of days that's who you are you are some days put together that's the reality of who you are. So each day that passes, that's part of you that you have lost. Each day passes, that's part of you that you have lost. And it's not coming back. Each day that passes, part of you has gone. You have lost it. So he defines us by time. So he says, you are basically made of time. And if you look at it, that you know, that makes so much sense. If you are meant to live, let's say, 60 years, then each day that passes, you are a bunch of days that make 60, 60 years. So each day that passes, that's part of you that has been taken away forever. And again, if you combine this with the previous statement, that means this day, this part of you that has gone now forever, will be either for you or against you. And it's not coming back. You're not coming back. Some of his uh, statements are actually, sometimes they are very critical and very strong words. So not everyone is able sometimes to take them uh, in, in a good way. So he says, for example, نضحك ولا ندري لعل الله قد اطلع على بعض أعمالنا فقال لا أقبل منكم شيئا. I want to mention something we mentioned last week. Yunus ibn Ubaid, rahimahullah. When he met Al-Hasan al-Basri and he, he spent some time with him, he said, Al-Hasan al-Basri would hardly open his mouth to talk. He would stay silent most of the time. But if he spoke, you wish he would never go silent. Because of the, So he didn't speak so much, but when he spoke, he spoke beautiful, profound words. So you would wish that he would even talk more. So he says, نضحك ولا ندري لعل الله قد اطلع على بعض أعمالنا فقال لا أقبل منكم شيئا. He says, you know, we are laughing, we're enjoying ourselves, and we don't know 
perhaps Allah looked at our actions and he said because they are not done well they're not done with a good intention they're not done in the right way uh, perhaps Allah says I'm not gonna going to accept any of your deeds so why should you laugh so we said Al-Hasan al-Basri his general demeanor was something we mentioned last week was about Al-Huzn was about sadness so he was he, he he took life seriously that was his general demeanor is it wrong there's no right and wrong there whereas his friend and his contemporary Al-Amr al-Shaabi he was more of a light-hearted person Al-Shaabi was a person who had a sense of humor Al-Hasan al-Basri was a person who was extremely serious about life and he would usually have this sense of sadness around him <coughs> another advice from him he would say wayhaka ya ibn adam hal laka bi muharabati allah min taqa innahu man asa allah faqad haraba he says woe to you son of adam do you have any power to fight against allah do you have any power to fight against your creator then he explains and he says anyone who disobeys allah then he is putting himself in a state of war and confrontation against allah He says, وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ أَقْوَامًا He talks about the companions. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ أَقْوَامًا كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا أَهْوَنُ عَلَىٰ أَحَدِهِمْ مِنَ التُرَابِ تَحْتَ قَدَمَيْهِ وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ أَقْوَامًا يُمْسِي أَحَدُهُمْ وَمَا يَجِدُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا قُوتًا فَيَقُولْ لَا أَجْعَلُ هَذَا كُلَّهُ فِي بَطْنِي لَأَجْعَلَنَّ بَعْضَهُ لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَيَتَصَدَّقُ بِبَعْضِهِ وَإِنْ كَانَ هُوَ أَحْوَجَ مِمَّا يَتَصَدَّقُ بِهِ عَلَيْهِ أَحْوَجُ مِمَّنْ يَتَصَدَّقُ بِهِ عَلَيْهِ He says, I've witnessed, I've seen people. He's talking about the companion of the Prophet ﷺ. This life for them was worthless. They didn't have any interest in it and it was equal to them like the dirt under their feet. It didn't have any value to them. And I've seen people, as well among the companions, that the only thing they possessed was the food of their day. Only the basic food of their day with which they can survive. And one of them would say, I'm not going to put all of this in my stomach. I shall make some of it for the sake of Allah. I should give out some of it for the sake of Allah. So he goes and he gives part of it as sadaqah. That's only the only thing he has the food of that day so he would give part of it as sadaqah and sometimes he himself is more in need than the person that he gives so he's talking about the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam then he says Ibn Adam innaka tamutu wahdak I mean, these, this is advice that is relevant to each one of us. So we're going to look at the advice or the wisdom of Al-Hasan al-Basri to try to see how we can implement it today. How we can implement it today. But as I said, you need to keep in mind that Al-Hasan al-Basri, as we said, he had this kind of serious, sad demeanor. And this doesn't necessarily work with everyone. But there is so much wisdom that you can learn. So you don't have to be exactly like Al-Hasan al-Basri, but you can always learn from his wisdom. So he says... ابن آدم إنك تموت وحدك وتدخل القبر وحدك وتبعث وحدك وتحاسب وحدك وأنت المعني وإياك يراد He is saying son of Adam when you die you will die alone you will die alone because the angels will come and drag your soul even if you're dying among a hundred people the experience of death is individual you're going to go through it by yourself not like this proverb, you know, today in, in the Arab world, uh, they have a, a proverb which they say, al maut ma'al jama'a rahmah. So dying with a group is mercy. But the reality is when you die, it doesn't make any difference. You're with a group or not. You're going through the, ex de the death experience. It's individual. So he's saying, إِنَّكَ تَمُوتُ وَحْدَكَ You die alone. You die by yourself. وَتَدْخُلُ الْقَبْرَ وَحْدَكَ When you are put in the grave, you are put by yourself. Someone might say there are family graves. In certain places, there are family graves, right? They, they bury the, the, the father, the mother, and the kids in the same grave. But still, each one of them is going to have their own grave. They're not going to, like, 
uh, talk with each other and, and enjoy themselves. No. Even though they are next to each other, but each one is different. Each one has their own grief. Each one lives in their own world. So you die alone and you enter the grave alone and you will be sent or you will be resurrected on the day of judgment alone and you will be held accountable. You will be questioned by Allah alone. So you are the point of focus here. He's saying, Antal ma'ni wa iyyaka yurad. So you, you should focus on yourself and you should get yourself ready for that moment. He says about, uh, he has a beautiful statement. He says, مَا خَافَهُ إِلَّا مُؤْمِنْ وَلَا أَمِنَهُ إِلَّا مُنَافِقٌ He says, no one fears Allah except a believer. And no one feels safe when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except a hypocrite. What does that mean? That means if you safe, I got it with Allah, alhamdulillah, I'm good. I made it with Allah. Once you get this feeling, he's saying this comes from hypocrisy. But if you are always careful that you have not given Allah his right, you have not been, you know, you have not offered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he truly deserves, I've never, I haven't done enough for the sake of Allah, you're always fearful of this, then he says this is a sign of Iman. And this is why one of the, uh, I think Sufyan al-Thawri, he said, مَنْ أَمِنَ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهِ طَرْفَةَ عَيْدٍ أو مَنْ أَمِنَ سَلَبَهُ إِيَّهِ Whoever feels safe, with regards to his heart that it's for Allah completely, then Allah would take it away from him. That means Iman and faith. So you always need to preserve your Iman. You always need to be careful about your Iman. Don't feel safe. Always be cautious when it comes to your Iman. Take precautions. Then he says, إِنَّ مِنَ النِّفَاقِ اخْتِلَافُ اللِّسَانِ وَالْقَلْبِ والسر واختلاف اللسان والقلب والسر والعلانية والمدخل والمخرج. He says from hypocrisy or a sign of hypocrisy is that what you say with your tongue is not in your heart. What's outside is not inside, or what's inside is not outside. So the congruency or the match between what's in your heart and what you say and what you display is a sign of iman. If there is discrepancy, that's a sign of hypocrisy. That's, that's a person mean that that's what it means to be transparent to be honest to be authentic to be authentic so for example one of the issues here that are very uh, very subtle and very hidden sometimes a person is doing something for their own vengeance for their own ego they're doing something that seems to be good but they're doing it for a personal reason and they don't even realize it because they are not clear with themselves. That's what Hassan al-Basri, by the way, is talking about. That's what Hassan al-Basri is talking about. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. But if that person really checks himself, checks his heart, he would, be, he would come face to face with the truth that he's not doing it for Allah. He's doing it for some personal reason. You, you can find it with the people you like, you're going to overlook their mistakes. The people you dislike, you're going to pick on their mistakes. You'll actually find their mistakes even when they're... You'll find mistakes even when there are no mistakes. Then you might say, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. But if you really scrutinize yourself, you'd realize you're not doing it truly for the sake of Allah. It's actually for your own self, for your own self-satisfaction. So he says, That's a sign of hypocrisy. That what's in your heart and what you display with your tongue, they're not exactly the same. What's hidden inside and what you show and display outwardly, if they are not exactly the same, that's a sign of hypocrisy. Then he says, والمدخل والمخرج, basically, you know, the reason you do things and, and, and how you do them, and how you do them, that also, ha they have to be congruent, they have to be identical. Then he says, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ قَوَّامٌ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ يُحَاسِبُ نَفْسَهُ لِلَّهِ The believer is always keeping himself in check. The believer always keeps himself in check. He is holding himself to account. He's holding himself to account. And subhanAllah, some of the early generations, when you read in their biographies, you will be uh, startled at, ex at what these people do. Some of them used to write down everything they said. 
everything they said, each word that came out of their mouth, they would write it down. And at the end of the day, they would check, is this for me or against me? For me or against me? For me or against me? So they were taking, you know, this kind of muhasaba, holding yourself to account. They were taking it literally. And this is why these people were careful before they said anything. And this is why uh, another tabi'i, he said, before you utter a word, you should ask three questions. First, is it true what I'm saying or is it false? That's number one. If it's true, okay, you pass the first test. Number two, if I say this word, is it going to bring about more goodness or more benefit? Or is not always going to bring harm or going to bring nothing? So if it brings benefit, say it. If it doesn't bring, any, it doesn't bring about anything or it brings harm, don't say it. That's test number two. Test number three is that, am I saying it with the right intention? Is it for the sake of Allah or is it for another reason? So he would say, don't utter a word before you uh, make it go through these three filters. Three filters. Is it true or false? Is it going to bring benefit? Is it for the sake of Allah? Is it the right intention? If it passes these three filters, then say it. If not, hold it back. And he, the, he gives here a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, figure of speech. He says, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ أَسِيرٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا يَسْعَى فِي فِكَاكِ رَقَبَتِهِ لَا يَأْمَنُ شَيْئًا حَتَّى يَلْقَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ مَأْخُوذٌ عَلَيْهِ فِي ذَلِكَ كُلِّهِ He says the believer in this life is captive. The believer in this life is captive, is, is a prisoner. You are a prisoner in this, in this life. Yes, فِي فِكَاكِ رَقَبَتِهِ He is trying, he is more like a, a, a captive of war. He is trying through this life, through the time that he has in this life, to free himself free himself obviously from the hellfire so he should be careful and he should invest everything until he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanallah uh, sometimes some of the righteous people when they say statements you realize they are talking about themselves but out of their humility they do not talk directly about themselves so they are actually explaining their state but they don't like for example they say some people are you know that's what they do and they themselves do this which is good but they don't attribute it to themselves they just want to give you the benefit without taking the credit so al hasan al-basri i believe here is talking about himself he says إن لله عز وجل عبادا كمن رأى أهل الجنة في الجنة مخلدين وكمن رأى أهل النار في النار مخلدين قلوبهم محزونة وشرورهم مأمونة حوائجهم خفيفة وأنفسهم عفيفة صبروا أياما قصارا تعقب راحة طويل تعقبها راحة طويلة أما الليل فمصافة أقدامهم تسيل دموعهم على خدودهم يجأرون إلى ربهم ربنا ربنا وأما النهار فحلماء علماء بررة أتقياء كأنهم القداح ينظر إليهم الناظر فيحسبهم مرضى وما بالقوم من مرض أو خولطوا ولقد خالط القوم من ذكر الآخرة أمر عظيم هذا profound statement a profound statement. He says, there are servants for Allah, some of the creation of Allah. They live in a state of certainty as if with their own eyes they, s they see the people of paradise have entered paradise. And the people of the hellfire have entered the hellfire. They have no doubt about it. They, as if they see it with their own eyes. Their hearts are full of sadness. Why? Because they are trapped in this dunya yet. That's where the sadness comes from. Shururuhum <laughs> ma'muna. They don't cause any harm to anyone. You feel safe around them. There will be no harm that comes to you from them. You, you don't even fear them. You don't even fear them. Hawa'ijuhum <laughs> khafifa. You know, even, jazakallah khair. Their needs are very simple 
and and min and minimal their needs they don't, they don't they don't need anything from you they don't you know their eyes are not attached to what you have in your hands because their need is for Allah so they don't need much of this dunya you don't feel that these this person wants something from me so you feel safe from that side وَأَنفُسُهُمْ afifa, and they have decent sense of self that is not after anything from this dunya they don't want anything from this dunya صَبَرُوا أَيَّامًا قِصَارًا so they've been patient, they've been holding themselves back, they've been trying to do just the right thing in these short days of this life. تَعْقُبُهَا رَاحَةٌ طويلة. Then after this short, this time of, of patience and, and perseverance and holding oneself back, afterwards there will be eternal days of happiness and comfort. At night these people stand up in prayer. They stand up in prayer. Their tears are roll, roll down their cheeks and they call upon Allah, our Lord, our Lord. During the day, these people are patient, easygoing with the creation of Allah. They are knowledgeable people who teach and they are barara, they are so righteous and so clear. At qiyya, and they are, they have, they live in fear of Allah. A person when he sees them, he thinks these people have some kind of illness. Why? Because of their concern. And this is why, uh, specifically Hassan al-Masri was known, this is his description actually. This is his description. He used to be sad most of the time that people thought, we, we mentioned that last week, that everyone who saw him, he thought a, a close person just died. One of his like dear people just passed away. So he was in that state of sadness. Why? Because he he's longing to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He feels trapped in this life. And some people see them and they think these people have lost their minds. And it's not that they have lost their minds, but these people are so busy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they don't show any interest in the matters of this world. He talks about Ahl Sunnah. He says, A Sunnah. وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ بَيْنَ الْغَالِي وَالْجَافِي فَاصْبِرُوا عَلَيْهَا رَحِمَكُمُ اللَّهِ He says the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is in the middle between people who go to extremes, people who push too hard and people who are too loose and lenient. بَيْنَ الْغَالِي وَالْجَافِي فَاصْبِرُوا عَلَيْهَا رَحِمَكُمُ اللَّهِ So be patient to hold on to it. Because when you hold it in the middle, it's easier to fall on either side. But to hold on to the sunnah is difficult. It requires a lot of patience. فَإِنَّ أَهْلَ السُنَّةِ كَانُوا أَقَلَّ النَّاسِ فِي مَا مَضَى The people of Ahl sunnah are a minority among, among humanity. And that's in the past. And in the future, in the present and the future, there will also be a minority. الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَذْهَبُوا مَعَ الْإِتْرَافِ أو مَعَ أَهْلِ الْتَرَفِ فِي إِتْرَافِهِمْ They are the ones who did not go with the people of affluence and luxury in their as they immerse themselves in the dunya and they did not join the people of bid'ah and innovation in their bid'ah and innovation and they remained patient upon the sunnah until they met their Lord. So he says, فَكَذَلِكَ كُونُوا So be like these people. Be like these people. So this shows the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is the middle path. And it's not easy to keep on. It's not easy. Why? Because usually, usually what you will find people around you are swerving away from it. Either getting too much attached to the dunya, okay, falling into sins, falling into desires, or you will find people who are more religiously sometimes motivated. You'll find these people who want to do more, so they fall into exaggeration. So they do things the Prophet ﷺ didn't do, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ didn't do. So they come up with new things. Why? Because they want to do more. They want to do more than what the Prophet ﷺ did, or they want to do. Uh, they do it in a different. They want to do it in a different fashion. We say, this is why the sunnah takes a lot of patience that you keep on it regardless of all the temptations of the people around. He has a profound statement here where he, he defines what a good Muslim is. He defines what a good Muslim is. He says, مِنْ عَلَامَاتِ الْمُسْلِمْ قُوَّةُ دِينٍ وَحَزْمٌ فِي لِينٍ وَإِيمَانٌ فِي يَقِينٍ وَحُكْمٌ فِي عِلْمٍ وَحَبْسٌ فِي رِفْقٍ I need to explain each one different, uh, separately. قُوَّةُ دِينٍ Strength in deen. That means belief, strong belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
وَحَزْمٌ فِي لِينَ Decisive. The believer is decisive, yet he's easy going. He has lean. Lean means easy going, kindness. So he's decisive, but he's also soft and kind. You see what he combines with? إِيمَانٌ فِي يَقِينٍ Belief with certainty. No doubt. وَحُكْمٌ فِي عِلْمٍ now, hukum in the Arabic language, hukum fi ilm. So he has knowledge. He combines with knowledge hukum. What's hukum? Hukum means two things in Arabic. It means control. That's where hakim, hukum, a leader or a ruler, this is where it comes from. So hukum. So hukumun fi ilm. So he has knowledge. And because of this knowledge, he controls his affairs with this knowledge. So he runs his affairs by knowledge. Hukum also, another meaning of it is hikmah. Is hikmah. This is why the name of Allah al-Hakim means two things. It means he is in control of everything. He has al-hukum. And he also, it also means he has hikmah. He has wisdom. So the believer, not he has this knowledge. He applies it on, on himself. He abides by it. And also his knowledge is mature. It has wisdom. Because some people have knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. Some people have the knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. I actually, uh, there's a beautiful statement from Sheikh al-Islam in Taymiyyah. It's a profound statement. I want to share it with you. It's very important to know what's the meaning of hikmah. He says in his book, Jami' al-Rasail, he says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُ يَنْبَغِي لَهُ أَنْ يَعْرِفَ الشُّرُورَ الْوَاقِعَةِ وَمَرَاتِبَهَا فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ كَمَا يَعْرِفُ الْخَيْرَاتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ وَمَرَاتِبَهَا فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ he says, the believer, he should know the evils that are existent, the evils that we have around us, and their levels, because evil is not one, one level, it's different levels. Some issues or some things are more evil than others. So levels, you need to know the nuances, that's what he's talking about, the nuances in, in evil. And their levels according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And the believer should know as well the good things that are around in our context according to their different levels of goodness as well. So good things are levels and evil things are levels. Then he says, فَيُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحْكَامِ الْأُمُورِ الْوَاقِعَةِ الْكَائِنَةِ وَالَّتِي يُرَادُ إِقَاعُهَا فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ So he can tell the difference between these different things that are in existence, these conditions that we're dealing with. So he recognizes them, each one for its own level of either goodness or, or evil. Then, لِيُقَدِّمَ مَا هُوَ أَكْثَرُ خَيْرًا وَأَقَلُّ شَرًّا عَلَى مَا هُوَ دُونَهُ So he says, he gives precedence to the things that are most goodly, okay, that are the highest in terms of goodness, and the things that are the least in terms of evil. Because choice in life is not between evil and good, by the way. You are choosing between two goods, okay, and two evils. So you choose the highest of both goods and the lowest of two evils. That's what a lot of the Imams said. They said, Al fiqh, ليس al fiqh an ta'rif al khayra min al sharr. Fiqh, understanding of Islam, of the deen, is not to know evil from good. Almost everyone knows this. لكن al fiqh. هو أن تعرف خير الخير خير الخيرين وشر الشرين، فتقدم خير الخيرين وأخف الشرين. So you give precedence to the highest of goods and the lowest of all evils. That's what the scholars have always been saying, and this is the reality of life because some people live in a utopia. They think it's all about good and evil. No, choices in life are about you're going to choose between two goods. You have, you have to choose one of them. And you have to give up one of them. And it's usually a choice between two evils. You have to fall in one of them. You have to fall in one of them. So you choose to fall in the lowest evil. But if you say, no, that's evil. I don't want to fall in it. So you avoid falling in the lowest evil. You end up following, falling in the biggest evil. That's why the scholar said that's the reality of fiqh. That you understand the different nuances and the levels of evil and good. And this is why sometimes when the shiukh or a scholar gives fatwa and someone says, Fear Allah, this is against hadith or against a verse from the Quran. Yes, it's against the hadith, but you don't see the context. 
Because if I run away from this, I'm going to fall in an evil that is even far greater than this, a greater sin. So because you don't see it, you're going to criticize. You're going to criticize. This is why Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah is saying, so you have to know, الشرور الخير والشرور الواقعة whatever is there whether it's good or evil and it's level as long as it's in existence so you choose the highest of, of, of what is good and the lowest of what is evil <coughs> so you basically create the ideal configuration that's why Islam is practical it's not, it doesn't tell you to live in a, some kind of an imaginary world in a utopia where everything's rosy no, life is about making choices. It's all about making hard choices. So, so, and uh, even Sheikh Islam to me in another place, he actually talks, he says, usually towards the end of time, people are gonna be faced with a situation where you will never be able to do good without doing evil with it. He says this, and this is in the 10th uh, volume of his Majmu' al-Fatawa. He says, there will be a time it will be a time where when people want to do good, they cannot do go this good or they, are, they cannot do this obligation in Islam unless they do something evil with it. So if they refrain from this evil, they will compromise on the obligation. Okay, <clears throat> so he says, I'll carry on with Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, statement. So he says, وَيَدْفَعُ أَعْظَمَ الشَّرَّيْنِ بِاحْتِمَالِ أَدْنَاهُمَا And he repels or pushes the worst of two evils by opting for the lowest evil. So you have to consciously make a choice to do something evil. That's what he's talking about. Why? Because that's the, that's the, that, that's the, the, the power of reality. You have to choose one of these two evils. So you, you opt for the lowest one. وَيَجْتَلِبُ أَعْظَمَ الْخَيْرَيْنِ بِفَوَاتِ أَدْنَاهُمَا And he chooses or he opts for the highest good to the exclusion of the lowest good. So you're going to give up some good as well. You're going to give up some good in order to achieve the greater good. Then he says, then how he explains, So he says, So the person who doesn't know what is in reality, the real situation, doesn't know the details of the situation, doesn't understand it well, and he doesn't understand what is required in religion this person does not know the rules of Allah or what Allah wants from his creation in this situation so in order to make a correct judgment Islamic judgment you need to understand the situation the details of the situation and you need to know the obligations and the prohibitions that pertain or that, that are pertinent to this kind of situation. Without this holistic understanding, you cannot make a decision. You cannot make an informed decision in Islam. So you have to understand the religion, you have to understand reality. When you understand them, now you can find out, you can find the different levels of good, the different levels of evil, then you can make the right configuration. In that configuration, inevitably, there will be some evil. Inevitably. And inevitably that you will be compromising on some good. Not because you don't want to do the good, but because you want the higher good. And you're doing the evil here, not because you want to do evil, but because you want to avoid the biggest evil. You have to fall into the lowest evil. Well, he says, وَإِذَا لَمْ يَعْرِفْ ذَلِكَ كَانَ قَوْلُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ بِجَهَلُ So anyone who does not understand this kind of all of these things that all of these things that he mentioned then he says if he says or he does anything this is based on ignorance that's the problem with students of knowledge when they read something they want to apply it across the board without understanding the situation you can't that's not how Islam is applied you need to understand the reality the context you need to understand religion okay what is Obligation, what is allowed, what is prohibited, and then you'll find the right configuration to achieve the highest level of good and the lowest level of evil. So without this kind of understanding of the context, the situation, and the religion, and, and the fiqh, you cannot arrive. It will be, as Ibn Taymiyyah says, this is jahl, this is ignorance. Then he says, وَمَنْ عَبَدَ اللَّهَ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ كَانَ مَا يُفْسِدُ أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا يُصْلِحُ And whoever worships Allah based on ignorance, then he will, the mischief or the corruption that he will bring about will be greater than the good that he is trying to achieve. And this is Jami' al-Rasail, volume 2, page 305. So again, back to 
uh, <coughs> الحسن البصري as he is describing the Muslim okay he's giving a description of a Muslim he's giving it by showing uh, some kind of a comparison some kind of a balance between traits so قوة دين strong religion strong deen حزم فيلين he's decisive yet he is soft and kind إيمان في يقين it's faith with certainty حكم في علم we said حكم في علم so he applies this knowledge and he makes it control his life and guide his life and also this knowledge has wisdom and this is why we mentioned it in Taymiyyah's statement you need this kind of wisdom it's not only knowledge okay I'm gonna apply it no this is raw knowledge you don't know how it's applied you still that's the first step when you learn the little bit of the little thing that you learned now how to apply it that's a different science that you need to embark on you need to start learning and 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 uh, reading and this is where maturity comes about وَحَبْسٌ فِي رفق. حَبْسٌ فِي رفق. حَبْس here means holding back holding back from giving so you don't give what does that mean that means the Muslim when he spends he spends okay with a measure he doesn't spend openly so حَبْسٌ فِي رفق. so with this kind of holding back you might not give people what they want you might not give your children everything they want but this is not out of viciousness this is with rifq he says this is with kindness this is with mercy as the poet says qasa liyazdajiru wa man yaku rahiman falyaqsu ahyanan ala man yarhami he say that sometimes a merciful person acts decisively like someone loves their their kids and they try to give their kids the, the best but the kids I want this I want this they start crying but I know this is not good for my kids or this is going to spoil my kid so I'm not gonna give in. I see the tears of my kids, but I'm not gonna, you know, give in. I'm not gonna, you know, uh, be weak and give my child everything they want. I want them to grow stronger. The other day I read one of the, uh, I think the richest person in India, and I think he's even a non-Muslim. He, he's a, he's a he's a billionaire. He has lots 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 of money, lots of wealth. He didn't give his child anything his son and he said to his son you have to make your way to richness yourself so his son started working on random jobs construction selling stuff in the street and so on and so forth until his own son made his own wealth and he said now I can feel safe that you can actually take care of this wealth now I'm not saying be extreme like this but it's worth you know getting the 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 child really to learn the, the value of money and not because what comes easy goes easy so the child is spoiled. So this is why it's not you want to hold back your money from your child, but you want goodness. You know that spoiling your child is going to make them weaker when they grow. It's not going to give them the experience they, uh, and the exposure to life that they actually require. So this is what حَبْسٌ فِي رِفْقٍ وَإِعْطَاءٌ فِي حَقٍ When you give, you give only with truth. You don't give like uh, randomly. You give where the money belongs to. Or you put kindness or help and service where it deserves to be where it deserves to be this is why the Arabs as well say this is a, a famous proverb you know when you do kindness with a person who doesn't deserve it you'll be humiliated you'll be humiliated so even the goodness that you do it you have to choose the right place to put it المتنبي <coughs> says <coughs> وأنت إذا أكرمت الكريمة ملكته وإن أنت أكرمت اللئيمة تمرد you know a person who is dignified a person of honor when you honor them as if you own them these people are going to be loyal to you because when you respect them they will respect you back they'll be loyal to you but when you honor someone who has an, who has grown to be evil, who has, makes bad choices, okay, a person, an indecent person. You honor them and you value them and you respect them, they will take advantage. They'll take advantage and they will humiliate you. They will humiliate you. So the goodness that you offer, put it where it belongs. So this is what إِعْطَاءٌ فِي حَقٍّ وَقَصْدٌ فِي غِنَى Moderation even at times of affluence and wealth. So when a believer has wealth, he's not going to, you know, go around squandering his money, buying this and buying that and spending this and spending... No. 
he puts the money where it should go. So there is a balance. Even when there is wealth, they don't abuse it and they don't just spend it like that. fi faqa. And when there is a need and lack, the person is patient. He doesn't start chasing people. Oh no, help me out! Help me out! Okay, uh, I'm, I'm I'm stuck. Can you can you can I, can I, can you you know give me some money? I start you know rushing after people. Give me this. Give me that. Give when they go through hardship, they hold on. They 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 they, they are patient with it. They're patient with it. So they suffer silently. They suffer silently. وَإِحْسَانٌ فِي قُدْرَةٍ And these people, إِحْسَان, here إِحْسَان means forgiveness, okay, in this context. So it says, when you are, oh sorry, no, إِحْسَانٌ فِي قُدْرَةٍ Here it means, so when the person has now wealth, okay, so in times of need, the person is going to endure patiently. But when the person has ability to spend and give, they're not going to keep it to themselves. They're going to offer it to others. They start offering. Once Allah gives them, they're going to give Allah's creation. They don't keep it even to themselves. What, uh, as Aisha radiallahu anha, when one day, uh, I think 3,000 dirham was brought to her. That was her share. So it was brought to her one day. So on that day, she started spreading it. This is for this woman. This is for that family. This is for this family. This is for that family. So t- when it was Maghrib time, when it was Maghrib time, no, there was nothing left. Nothing left from this money. So her servant says to her, you should have left a little bit. Uh, we haven't bought any food. She said, I forgot. You should have told me. <laughs> I forgot. Now we have nothing. So that was Aisha radiallahu anha. So ihsanun fi qudra. Wa ta'atun ma'aha nasiha. Ta'a, obedience to Allah, which has with it what? Nasiha. And nasiha, I believe I explained in one khutbah, what nasiha actually means What nasiha means I thought the mic was making that noise Okay Ta'at ma'aha nasiha Nasiha is to put your heart in something So yes It's usually translated as advice But the reality of nasiha Nasiha in the Arabic language means Having a pure heart When you put your heart in something That's what nasiha So ta'atun ma'aha nasiha That means you obey Allah from the bottom of your heart You put your heart and mind in it وَتَوَرُّعٌ فِي رَغْبَةٌ Tawarru is to keep yourself From the things that are even halal Why? Because very likely These halal things are gonna Make you slip into something that is Shady or even haram so wara' is to take a shield, you know, give up some halal things. Why? Because you have a weakness there. You have a weakness there. These, this halal might lead you, okay, to slip into something haram later on. So you leave this halal for that. Or if there's a little bit of doubt there, you prefer to be clear. So tawarru'un fi raghba, he's saying even when you have a desire in something and you realize th- this is your weakness, a believer would hold back from it. وَتَعَفُّفٌ وَصَبْرٌ فِي شِدَّةٌ When the time of hardship, there is decency, a sense of decency, so the person does not chase people for help and uh, support, and the person holds on and endures patiently. So that's a description. So he, then he carries on. لَا تُرْدِيهِ رَغْبَتُهُ وَلَا يَبْدُرُهُ لِسَانُهُ Wallah, this is profound. He says, his desire does not make him put himself down. So when he desires something, it's, it, he doesn't compromise his dignity. If he gets it with honor, he gets it. If he, if he doesn't get it, he's not going to put himself down and start begging or, or you know, exposing himself to some kind of, you know, uh, to any kind of an awkward situation where he might lose or compromise his dignity. His tongue doesn't take the better of him. That means he's in control of his tongue. His tongue is not in control of him. So before he speaks, he makes his calculations. وَلَا يَسْبِقُهُ بَصَرُهُ And his eyesight does not look at anything before he decides to look at it. That means he preserves his gaze. What's haram? He doesn't look at it. Okay? So it's not like, because there are people who tell you, I can't control my eyes, right? They keep looking at women, right? I can't control my eyes. The believer is the opposite. You control your eyes. It's not your eyes are, you know, preceding you to everything. Then you start catching up. Okay. 
وَلَا يَغْلِبُهُ فَرْجُهُ And his desire, sexual desire does not take the better of him as well. It does not lead him, it does not control him, it does not abolish his mind and his intellect. وَلَا يَمِيلُ بِهِ هَوَاهُ And his desires do not guide him. They do not lead him. وَلَا يَفْضَحُهُ لِسَانُهُ His tongue does not expose him. It does not put him in, in awkward positions. وَلَا يَسْتَخِفُّهُ حِرْصُهُ And any desire in anything, okay, as, as previously he said, it does not make him act in awkward ways to get it. So he's in control basically of his desires. He's a man of his desires. وَلَا تُقَصِّرُ بِهِ نِيَّتُهُ And that's it. His actions or his intention is far greater than his actions. His intention is far greater than his actions. That's what لا تقصر به نيته means. That means his intention is always for good and his actions cannot keep up with his intention. His actions, like he, no matter how much he tries, his actions are not enough to catch up with his intention. He always wants to do more good. So that's his description of uh, of a believer. Now we run out of time. There is so much, subhanAllah, to share from Al Hassan Al Basri. He's really a man of, of wisdom. So I think this should be enough, inshallah. This should be enough. I will try to start sharing some wisdoms as well. I'll try to keep each time, each halaqa, complete a person's life. So we're not going to do more segment one and segment two. We'll just keep each halaqa for one person. So that would be, that's better. And inshallah, we'll share some of their words of wisdom and their relevance to our times. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.